Hey, good morning, church. It's, it's really good to be with you guys again this week. Another Sunday where I get to welcome you from behind a screen. Um, you know, um, it's what? I don't know. It's so many weeks now since we're in COVID. I can hardly even count how long that we're in COVID kind of shut down. And quite honestly, we don't know when we're going to get back together. Um, you know, we're at the mercy of the school board. But um, until then, you know, I want to keep encouraging you guys to have your small groups and, and um, your Zoom calls and your WhatsApp and just reach out to each other by, by phone and keep in contact. Um, I have a message that I believe that God is going to speak to some people today. But before I get into that message, let me just pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask that you speak through me now as I deliver what you have laid on my hearts to your people far and near. In Jesus' name, amen. So as, as I oftentimes like to do, you know, this morning I'm going to start off with, with, with a question. I got a question for you guys. So here's, here's a question. It's like, have you ever been in love? It's like, you know, I don't matter how old you are, just think back to a time when you're in love. And, you know, some people's like, well, I don't even know if I've ever been in love. All right, so let me ask you this question. And so have you ever, have you ever thought, I remember, think back to a time when you thought you were in love um, and if you, if you, it's like, I never, I don't remember if I thought I was in love. All right, let, let me ask a third question. Uh, how many of you have like liked a person and found out that that person liked you back? Now think back into like, you know, if you're, and if you're one of our seniors, just think back to way back when, when you were in school. All right, good. So now that you have the picture in your mind, you know, when I was in, when I, when I, when I was in high school, I, I dated a girl that was a few years older than me. And, and I was having fun dating a, a college girl. I was, I was in high school. And, and things were all right. And as the young people would say, and I was just vibing. I was just chilling, vibing. And, and, and then one day she she's asked me this question. She goes, <laughs> Gary, w w what do we have? What, w w what is this? What kind of relationship do we have? It's like, I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, where is this, where is this relationship going? And, and I was just like chilling. I, I was perfectly fine. It was. And, and and she said, "I want us to define this relationship. Define the relationship." And I, I first um, talked about this 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 concept about five years ago, but it's really one of the things. It's called I call it a DTR moment. Define the relationship moment. And and I'm gonna sound like a guy, and you guys can send me email and say nah, nah. say guys do that too, but girls do that. You know, They're like you know you. Go out for a while, you vibe, and then they're like, like oh, what is this? What, what do we have? And, and the thing is, is that I, I can distinctly, distinctly remember that because at that time, I, w I was kind of faced with a decision. And the decision that I was faced with was, is this, is this real? Or is this real, or is this, 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 was this just fun? Uh, you know, like, <laughs> am I really seriously interested in a relationship like a committed relationship with this girl or was I just really committed to the idea of a relationship oh, you know and and I started thinking through like like what do I want to do like why was I in this like for for convenience or or really what I could get out of it and just really the kind of thought was in his mind was like I went into this relationship with like, really, what's in it for me? I was having fun. I really, you know, it sounds kind of bad, but I didn't really, I mean, I cared about it, but I didn't really care about it. It was really about me. And in, inadvertently, if you've ever, you know, kind of been in a relationship and you just started out, eventually one of you guys is going to come to the point where somebody's going to force a decision, where you have to make a decision. You know, what is, you know, you probably think it's like, you know, what is he to me really? Or what is she to me really? Or is, is this like, you know, like my little side piece here? Or, or I am committed to this relationship. And pretty much all relationships, all, you know, voluntary relationships start off the same way. You start off with the question. And, and, and if you think back, and that's why I ask you to think back about it, she's like, you know, like, you know, like it could be a friend. It could be something romantic. It doesn't, it's like any relationship. Like, yes, I are well, you meet somebody and like, do I really like this person? You know, and, and, and you go through like, do I really like how this person makes me feel? Do I, do I like 
how they look? Do I like what they can buy me? And, and you go through all these things, but at the center of everything that you're going through, there's this kind of one word in there. It's the I or me, or as a group named Delaso would say, it's just me, myself and I. And you know, <laughs> for the past three weeks, we've been doing a series that, that, um, that we've called Follow, where we've been looking at an invitation that Jesus gave to the people he came in contact with when he was walking around on earth. And everywhere Jesus went, he gave the same invitation. Sometimes he gave the invitation. He, he gave the invitation with words. Other times he gave the invitation by example. And, and um, sometimes it's both. And it was really was this invitation to follow. You know, Jesus like, come follow me. Follow what I'm doing. And, and you know, he's like, follow my, it's like I broke it down like the first week. He's like, first one was like, follow my example. Jesus is like, you know, look what I'm doing and, and do the same thing. And follow my teachings. And, and, and follow the path that I've set out for you and invited you to follow. And that path really is to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and go out and make a difference. And, and Jesus gave this invitation over and over and over again to, to find. And, and, and what we said in, in week one, it's like three steps of a ladder. That Jesus gives an invitation to say, hey, follow my example. And, 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 and you'll find out that you'll start to live a better life. If you just look at how Jesus treated people and follow that example of how he treated people. If you look at how when situations came up and how Jesus handled those situations, he's like, you know what? I'm going to imitate that. I'm going to follow that. It's kind of the whole, the whole WWJD, what would Jesus do? Just trying to think about what Jesus would do and you just kind of imitate that. And if you did that, what you'd find out is that if you just imitate Jesus, you don't believe that he's God, you don't believe anything, just by imitating what he did, you'll find out that, and how he handled the situation, you find out that you have less stress in life, and you'll find out that you'll handle difficult situations with more wisdom, you'd, handle, you'd find that, that, that your life would just start being better. And, and some of you, you know, may just be ready for step one, you know, wrong one off the ladder. You step on the ladder. He's like, somebody listening out there says, you know, I don't know about this Jesus thing. I don't know about this God thing. I don't know about anything, but I know Jesus was a pretty good guy. I'm just going to follow some of the things that he did. And I call that the no commitment option. Because there's a no commitment option because you can jump in and follow or you can jump out and don't follow. And you'll find out that the areas where you follow him in, it'll just work out better than the areas where you don't follow him in. So that's wrong one on the ladder. Step two, or the second rung of the ladder, is to not only follow his, his example, but follow his teachings. And, and the teachings of the people he inspired to write the Bible. And he inspired a bunch of, bunch of people to write the Bible. And you know, something that I've discovered is that literally there is nothing that you will ever experience in life that the Bible doesn't teach about, that the Bible doesn't talk about. It, it, there's literally nothing. The, you know, uh, some of the best leadership advice or probably the best leadership advice I've ever gotten, I've gotten from the Bible. Um, some of the best relationship advice I got from the Bible. The best financial advice to manage my personal finances and to think about give, save, live and all that I got from the Bible. The best parented advice I got from the Bible. The best decision-making advice I got from the Bible. I got from the teachers of the Bible. It's the most practical book for living. It, it, it is like a handbook for life. And, you know, one of these things that I heard a preacher say many years ago when I was about 15, 16. When you think about the Bible, you think that it's, it's like an acronym. It stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. <laughs> That's the Bible. Basic instructions before leave the earth. And if, if you, and, and if you don't have a Bible, man, I'm telling you, get one and start reading it. You'll find out that, that your life will start to change. And, and you're like, well, where do I get one? I'm like, man, in today's day and age, it's so easy. Go to the app store and just download the Bible app. And, and um, you can get that. You can get the Bible app. And, and so that's step two, right? Step one, you follow his example. Step two, you follow his teachings. 
But step three is like he's called you to more than that. And what you'll find out that is as after you go through the two steps, uh, the, the, you know, you'll just automatically just be drawn to like, man, this is working out so well that you'll want to over time without even knowing it, want to go follow step three, which is to follow his path. And here's a path that he's uniquely created for you. You see, when, when you, you were created and I was created, we all were created with a unique DNA. With our, there's no two people who have the same DNA. And we were created uniquely for a special purpose that when you discover it and when you utilize it, your life will be less stressful. You'll have more satisfaction in life. And, and if, if you want to know how to do that, you just send me a message and, and you know, I'll send you some information on how you can t do some tests to make you, help you discover, um, discover that in your purpose. But what you'll find out, and I'm going to tell you, you got to just try it, that following Jesus will actually make you a better father. Following Jesus will make you a better mother. Following Jesus will make you better parents overall. It will make you better grandparents. It will make you a better leader, a better boss, better employee, a better friend. When you follow Jesus' example, it's going to make you more honest. It's going to make you forgive quicker. It's going to make you serve with more enthusiasm. It's going to make you more generous. It's going to give you less stress. And overall, it's just going to make you a better person. Tremendously huge benefits if you just take those things. Step one, step two, step three. And, you know, and, and, and in fact, Jesus himself said, it's like, hey, you guys need to follow me. He said it's in Matthew 7, 4, um, 7, 24 through 27. He said this, therefore, if, if everyone, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, as Jesus talking, these words of mine, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. It, it, Jesus was saying that everyone who follows my examples, my teachings, and everyone who discovers God's and f God and finds freedom and discover their purpose and go out and make a difference, everyone who does that, if you follow that and you do that, what's going to happen? <laughs> when people let you down, you know what's going to happen? When, when people let you down and you just immerse yourself in, in Chick Flick PG. We talked about that last week. If you don't know what that is, go What's last week's message? But when you do stuff like that and people hurt you and things come and the storms of life and you lose your job, you'll be like a palm tree in a hurricane. What will happen is that the winds will blow and it'll blow and it blow and it blow, but you know what happens? It stands up because you'll be like a house built on the rock, firm, immovable by following God's, by following Jesus' example and, and doing what Jesus you know, said to do. But he goes on to say, and this again is Jesus talking. He said, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and beat together the house. And it fell down in a great crash. And Jesus was saying, he's like, look, if you choose not to follow my example, my teachings, and my path, what will happen is that when the storms of life come, when you lose the job, when that person hurts you, when, when you know, your kid doesn't act right, when your grandkids don't act right, when, you're, when your friends desert you, what's going to happen is that you are going to be buffeted and it's going to knock you over. And Jesus is like, you just need to follow these words of mine because that's what's going to happen when you don't don't and that's why we say all the time following jesus will not only make your life better but it will make you better at life but you see there is more to it than this right because if all you ever think about in your relationships like i talked about at the beginning is what's in it for me you're really just like a consumer if you think about your relationship with Jesus as what's in it for me, I'm going to follow because it's going to make my life better only. I mean, just all that you think about is that you're just really a consumer. For you, for you uh, Jesus is just a product. And you're a consumer. You go out and buy the product because of what it's going to give you. 
And, 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 and in our modern day culture, being a consumer is just fine. You know, we love being a consumer. When we come to church, we like to sit down, enjoy good music, good show, and do that, and then get out of there because we're a consumer. We love consumer. We, we, we're, just, we're just wired that way. And, and um, you know, where else could you go, right? And, and Charles, you know, one of our pastors said this one time. He's like, you know, somebody, somebody went to church and just dropped, you know, uh, a dollar in there. He's like, where can I get a show, a great show, and hear a great, great message and, and for like getting for a dollar? But the, the fact is that when, you know, when we think of Jesus as consumer, we just think about the better life that we have and the get out of hell free card that we have. But you see, Jesus' invitation to follow doesn't end, doesn't just end with being a consumer. There is more to it than that. Because being with Jesus, being a consumer of Jesus comes with a fine print. <laughs> and everybody knows, right? That whenever you buy a product, say, say you go out, and we all know this, right? If you go to buy a car, what happens? It comes with an instruction manual. And, and in the instruction manual, you don't see all the stuff that you got to do to maintain the car when you buy the car. You just see the pretty car. And then you got it, like, oh, I got to put oil in it. I got to do this. I got to do that to, to maintain the car. When you, if you download a piece of software, what comes with something, you got to click accept. It's called an end-user license agreement, a EULA. And, and you got to accept that. And, and same with Jesus, coming with Jesus, man, it comes with a fine print. Everybody knows that intuitively, that you can't be a consumer without having to accept the fine print. There's a saying that I use all the time, it says there are no free lunches. Everything has a cost. It may seem free, but it costs something. And you can't buy a product without there's being a, a cost behind it. And some things that you got to do, there's always some fine print. A fine print that you don't see outside the package, but you only see it once you open up the package. In, in case you want, it's like, okay, Gary, what, what is this fine print? Well, here is it in Jesus' own words. It's found in Mark 8. And, uh, you know, and, and the story here is that well, I'll tell you a story in a second, but you know me, I'd like to give you a little background of the story to provide some context. So the context is Jesus had just finished feeding 4,000 hungry people with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. It, it was a different case than when he fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, so probably about 8,000 people then, with, with, you know, with, with, with bread and fish also. Um, this one was different. This was 4,000 people. And he had collected seven baskets and left, uh, you know, of leftovers, seven baskets of leftovers from seven loaves of bread for 4,000 people. Go figure that. That's an incredible miracle. The people got, they got their dinner and they got a Jesus show. And right after that, Jesus gets in the boat with his, uh, you know, with his 12 closest followers and they set out and they went across the, the lake. And they realized when they set out that they forgot the seven basket of leftovers. They, they, they was like, and so, you know, all they had was one loaf that they kept back for themselves that they didn't give to Jesus' share of. Now, uh, you know, if you're reading too fast, you actually miss that. Imagine Jesus going to feed the 4,000 people and he said to the disciples, hey, y'all have any food? And they're like, yeah, Jesus, we got some bread. They, gave, they had eight. They gave Jesus seven. They kept one back. <laughs> they give one back because they're like, man, what's in it for me? I want to make sure I have some lunch, you know, because all this bread is going to give out. And that was after Jesus had fed the 5,000. So they, they, they should have intuitively known that, you know, that, that the bread wasn't a big deal. <laughs> Jesus could just make more bread, you know, if they wanted to do. But they're human beings. And just like us, somebody forgets something. It's like, so you get out and apparently they start arguing and like arguing, like, John, how could you forget the bread? Or Peter's like, man, I thought you were going to pick it up. Matthew, you're good at counting stuff. You count the baskets of bread and taking the bread. And, and I can imagine that, that they're arguing in the boat and about who was supposed to take the, the bread and all that. And, and we only got one bread left. And we had seven there, there. And, and I imagine just Jesus sitting down by the side. And he's being completely exasperated by this, and he's exasperated by them. And like, and 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 and, and uh, it's probably best best telling you the words 
of Jesus. In verse 17, Mark 8, 17, Jesus, aware of their discussion. So that's how he knew they were having a discussion. Jesus asked them, what are we talking about? Are we talking about having no bread? He's like, do you still not see or understand? Are, is, is, are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and, and you have ears but fail to, to hear? And, and, and don't you remember? You guys don't remember when I brought the five loaves for the 5,000 people? And how many baskets I had left? How many baskets did you pick up? And they're like, 12. And, and Jesus is like, and, and don't you remember just like, just like just a couple seconds ago, I broke seven loaves of bread and, and fed 4,000 people? And, and, and by the way, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. <laughs> Jesus said, you still don't understand? And, and Jesus was, was like, <laughs> I don't get you guys. I don't get you guys. You see what I just did? You, you, see, you see what I just did before? You just, you just saw it. And we're here and we're talking about bread? And we're, and we're, and we're, we're, we're talking about leftovers? Is, is, is that what we're talking about? But you see, for the disciples, it was always about being a consumer. They were always thinking about themselves first, like what's in it for me? We call it with him. What's in it for me? W. I-I-F-M. And that's why they kept a loaf back from giving up to Jesus to distribute. It really should have been <laughs> one more loaf. And that's why they were so worried about what they left behind. They were simply acting like what they were and what we oftentimes are. Consumers. Consumers of the benefits of following Jesus. So then Jesus did something. He's like, guys, let me show you the fine print. The fine print that comes with the invitation to follow. Here's what he said in Mar Mark 8, 27. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the village, villages around Caesarea Philippi, and in a way, he asked him a question, a question that he asked him before. And he's like, hey, guys, who do people say I am? It's like, who do they say I am? And they replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. They thought, you know, maybe it was Elijah. People thought Elijah had reincarnated or something. And still others said one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, what about you guys? Who do you say I am? And Peter is the one who's always speaking up. He's like, you're the Messiah. And Jesus is like, shh, just, all right, don't tell anybody about that. Just keep, keep, keep that quiet for now. Hey, you, you know, the, can you imagine the, the conversation? Jesus is like, hey, guys, who am I? Who am I? And Peter's like, man, you're Jesus. You, you're the man. You're the man. You're the man we follow. And, and Jesus was thinking, yeah, yeah, you say all of that. You know why you say all of that, Peter? Because you're a consumer. Because you're in it for what you can get. You're in it for what you can, from what you get out of my relationship, Peter. You get popularity, Peter, from hanging out with me. Yeah, you get you get all this. And you see, Jesus knew that Peter was was thinking that way because he knew that one day Peter was going to be forced with a decision, and he knew Peter was going to like. It was no longer convenient to be a follower of Jesus. So when Jesus, Peter was saying, Peter, man, God, you're the man. I love you. I love you. I love God. He, he, was, he was saying all of that. He, you know, he knew what was going to happen when Peter came to that moment, that one day. But that's for another day. And then Jesus started, you know, and Jesus, you know, after he goes through that, he starts telling them, telling his, his disciples, what's going to happen to him? He's like, he's like, Man, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be tortured, and I'm going to be executed. And he's telling his, his disciples that, and he's telling the crowd, you know, a couple people there, the crowd, the crowd was there. And I, I like what it says there. If you read a passage, it's just like fascinating story in Mark 8. You should read it sometime. Peter, Peter gets Jesus, and he, and he pulls Jesus and says, come here, Jesus. Come here, Jesus. Let me, let me talk to you for a second. He's like, he's like hey, hey um, can you like cool out on the, the death and the torturing thing? Because... 
you know, that, that's that's like a Debbie Downer. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, we they want to see some miracles or something. We don't know exactly what what he said, but whatever he said annoyed Jesus to no end. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Peter's like, "Hey, Jesus, you're the man. You're the man. I've seen you do things. You know, I've seen you move." You move the mountains, right? You, you know, he's, he, he, you get mad. He's like, stop talking about, he, he's like, you don't have to be arrested. He's like, nobody can take you. I said, like, you told me yourself. When I told you, you're the Messiah, he's like, don't tell anyone. You know it. And Jesus looks at Peter, and how we know that Jesus was kind of exasperated with Peter is what happens next in verse 33. Jesus turned around, he looked at the disciples, and then he looked back at Peter, and he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. <laughs> he was like, Peter, Peter, you know what? All you really care is about yourself and what's in it for you. Peter, you don't really care about me and my mission and my purpose and my make and my going out and making a difference. P Peter, you don't really care about my path. You don't really care about my agenda. You're hanging out with me, Peter, because of what's in it for you. And Peter, that's not God's talk. Not even that, that's not, not even God's spirit talking to you. You know what? That is Satan talk. And so Jesus looked and he recognized that the thoughts that Peter was spewing out came, came from somebody who was evil, a spirit being that was evil that was telling Peter nonsense. And so he looked straight into Peter's eyes and he said, get thee behind me. He's like, in, in, in other words, he was like telling the spirit, the, you know, the satanic spirit, the demonic spirit that was talking to Peter. He's like, get around so I can talk to Peter. Get away so Peter can understand. And then, and so how, we, how I believe this and, and how I came to that conclusion because what happens next is that Jesus turns to the 12 disciples there and the crowd, because there's a crowd watching and, and that was nearby and he says this, he's like, whoever wants to be my disciple or my committed follower must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me and the sake and the, of the gospel will save it what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul you know when jesus said this he undoubtedly caught the attention of the crowd because everybody was aware of the cross. Because Roman, Ro the Romans had, had brought in the, a, a form of execution called crucifixion. And the Romans would leave up the cross. So people know that, hey, if you try to go against the Roman Empire, you are going to be crucified. And so it was a reminder of pain. It was a reminder of loss of life. It was a reminder of discomfort. It was a reminder of the things that you had to give up. It was a reminder... Jesus is like, well, you know, if you follow me, if you want to follow me, Peter, like you say you want to do, and if you want to follow my example, here is what it means. Just like how I have to take up my cross, you too are going to have to take up your cross. See, for me, Peter, my cross is in giving up my life. For you, your sacrifice will be your sacrifice. Whatever sacrifice you do, it is your cross. I mean, he says, take up your cross, not as a sacrifice. It's going to, you know, it's, it's, in other words, he said, Jesus said, if you follow me, it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself from something that you want. If you're going to follow me, you can't do everything that everyone else is doing. If, you, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to say no sometimes. You're going to have to sometimes say no to that, that next shot or that next drink. 
you're going to have to say no sometimes to that other piece of cake because you had it too much already. We all know what it means to deny yourself when you, you say, I know what I want, but I know that what I want is not good for me. You're going to have to say no to that invitation to be in that place where you want to be so bad that you can feel it, but you know you shouldn't be at. Jesus is saying, Peter, following me is free, but it's eventually going to cost you something. To the people listening there, that would have been a huge downer because just like us, they wanted all the benefits without any costs. They wanted all the benefits without any costs. And well, we all do that. I would love to buy a car and have a car that didn't need maintenance or gasoline. But now they're thinking, <laughs> because when somebody tells you the fine print, you start to think. Man, is it really a good deal to follow Jesus? It's, I know it's a good deal to follow it when it's free, but man, is it worth it when it's going to cost me some fun or it's going to cost me some money or it's going to cost me some ridicule or it's going to cost me the girl that I think would be just so fine as in some arm candy. Or that guy is just a stallion like I always tease my wife about. But you know it's not good for you. <laughs> you start to think if the life I get with Jesus is worth the cost of following Jesus. And then I love Jesus, man. He's, Jesus is the, like the coolest guy ever. If you, if you, man, you just, you just got to read about it. Jesus is, 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 he's just dope. He's just, think of any word that you want to say, you know, to describe somebody. Because it was, it was like Jesus could read their minds that they were thinking all this stuff. Like, when well, I want this whole cost thing, this cross thing, whatever. Like, he's like, is your mind? It's like, <laughs> well, the fact is, you know, he could read their minds. He, he said this. <laughs> he said this. You know, guys, every one of you is going to die someday. Every one of you is going to die someday. No matter how well you eat, how well you exercise, all the things that you try to do to prolong your life, to save your life, well, one day you're going to lose it and you're going to die and then he goes on to say whoever loses the life that they desire whoever loses the thing whoever says no to the thing that they desire they, they i don't know what you desire maybe it's a party life you know i love going to the last, you know party rocky and uh, whatever whatever it is wh whoever desires the life of the substance overuse Whoever, whoever enjoys the lies about substance abuse, whoever wants the promiscuous life, whoever wants the, the work all the time life, whoever wants the, the messed up priorities life because I'm working so much, whoever loses that life and trades it in for the life that I desire for them, the trades in for life that they were uniquely designed and created and purposed for. Whoever gives up that life for the life I purpose for them, they will save it. And Jesus was like, when you lose that life for this life, the life that I'm going to give you, then you truly have life and life more abundantly. He, he, he went on to say, hey, 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 hey guys, hey guys, um, by the way, while this life will be better, I'm not even only really talking about this life. Because the fact is that there's a whole other life that goes on after this life. That when, that when this life is over, because you will die one day, 
and you go to the next life, in the next life, if you give up that life for this life, in this life, you're going to spend it with Jesus. You're going to spend it with the angels. And you're going to spend it forever and eternity. And you're going to spend it. But if you choose that life, then you're really going to lose the afterlife in that life. I mean, you're going to end up in a place where you created for Satan and his demons. He didn't create for you. Following me is going to cost you that life. He was like, guys, I want you to think about this for a second. And, and, and we're talking about your soul here. We're talking about eternity here. What good? And then you ask them this question that everybody would have known the answer to. He's like, can you imagine that you get to the end of your life? You're at the end of your life and you're sitting there and it's complete your decision. And, and Jesus said to you, do you want the life with me and my angels in heaven? Or do you want this life with the, with the, the devil and, and his demons? It's like, which one of you would not choose the life with me? Come on, everybody knows that, right? Nobody wants that. And he's like, we're talking about your soul here. What good is it for you to amass all this fun and all this money and all this sex outside of marriage and all this whatever if you're going to die one day and leave it all behind and you end up over here. Would you rather that life or would you rather lose your soul, your eternity? He's like, guys, come on. Think about it. And right then and there, the disciples in the crowd had their DTR moment. And Jesus was like, let's define this relationship here. Jesus was like, what do we have here? Let's define this relationship because following me is going to, sooner or later, it's going to cost you something. You know, some of you, it's, it's school time back, and some of you are going off to college. Some of you have moved out of elementary school, gone into middle school. Some of you are going into high school. Some of you are out of college and starting to work. And, and, and you know, it's just, I'll just pick on college students for a second. You know, but apply it to any situation in your life, right? You know, there are no parents. You're off at college, there's no restrictions. And all these options presented to you will be fun options. And you're going to be like, <laughs> you're going to have to say, about that life, about that life, right? And some, and some of you will be faced with a major decision. And as I start going through this, right, you know, you can just insert yourself here because you know that you're going to be faced, all of us here are going to be faced with a major decision shortly. And the decision could be, am I going to stay with my spouse that no good, da-da-da-da-da, fill in all the blanks, what you're thinking right now about your spouse, or I'm just going to throw in the towel and I'll leave them. And you're at that decision point. Or maybe it's a decision point to, am I going to work out some scheme and finesse and get some extra stimulus money when the Congress finally decides on it? Like, how can I scheme and get that? Or it could be a decision to, to forgive someone who hurts you deeply. And you're faced with that decision. Am I going to forgive them? Because that's the example of Jesus. Because that's that life. Or am I going to follow Jesus' example and lead this life? Are you going to face with a major decision to whether or not you should move out of your parents' home? Or are you going to face a decision about maybe I should move out of town and move to Atlanta? You know, Atlanta is like heaven to, you know, to a lot of people, right? And, and you know, I'm, or, and, and, you know, and maybe it's North Carolina. Maybe that's your heaven. Um, you're going to face a decision. It could be a decision to, hey man, to partake, partake in some illegal substance use or some legal substance overuse. And, and you're right there at the decision point. Is it one more shot? Is it a smoke? Is it a pill? Is it a whatever? Is it a snort? It's, is it whatever? Is it going to the, that, that, that room or to that girl's house or to that guy? Whatever it is. Is it filling out that application online? You're going to face with that decision right there and right at that decision point. 
And then it's going to feel wrong. And you're going to want to do it because you know the benefits of doing it. He's like, because it's, it's that life. It's that life. And you, and, but you're going to feel a little consternation. And, you, and then, you know what? You're going to hate me because you're going to remember this message. And then you'll be faced with a decision. Do I live that life only to lose it? To lose real life? Or do I, know, do I say no to that life and say yes to this life, which is Jesus? Fact is, salvation is free. You don't have to do anything. Jesus paid it all. But truly following Jesus will eventually cost you something. So, when you face your DTR moment with Jesus, when you face your DTR moment with a decision on whether or not to follow Jesus, example, and forgive, and to say no, and to not do that, or to say yes, or to refrain from gossiping, or whatever it is that that decision that you face. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know, for someone listening today, your DTR moment is right now because that consternation and that feeling that I talked about, you're feeling it right this second. That maybe you've been a consumer of Jesus but you haven't been a committed follower. You jump in when it's convenient to follow. You jump out when it's not convenient to follow. And so Jesus is saying, well, what are you going to do? And some of you, you just like decided that I don't believe in God. And Jesus is like, I'm talking to you right now. The person who you say you don't believe in is speaking to you right now so what are you going to do I want to give you the opportunity as I close to right now to say no to that life and to say yes to this life the life that Jesus has to offer if you want to do that you just say this prayer after me it's saying no and it's saying yes say this prayer right where you are heavenly father lord i don't want to live that life i'm tired of living that life i'm tired of just being an, a no commitment consumer but i want to be a completely committed devoted follower lord i know that i'm going to have to say no to stuff help me to say no lord forgive me of all my sins and I commit to living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to tell you that if you made that decision, you've now moved from a part-time consumer into a disciple and into a follower of Jesus. And your blessed life is about ready to gain. If you have forgotten what that life is, you've, been, you've said yes, and then you've gone back to that life, the invitation for you is to leave that life Whoever wants that life will lose it. Whoever wants this life will save it.